Welcome to Bunty UK podcast. This is episode two. You're greeted here by me, Davey. And I'm Tony. I'm Simon. And Alan. What have we got coming up today, folks? We've got a uh, Ubuntu Open Day interview with Diane Ruby and uh, Simon. A chat with Dave Murphy. Ah, schwuck. Yes. We're going to talk about um, hardware and uh, we're going to talk about the feedback that we received from uh, the first podcast. Okay, let's get on with it. So last week we mentioned an Ubuntu demo day at Swindon Museum of Computing, was it? That's right. I went uh, along to see Diane and um, have a chat with her. Cool. Should we have a listen to that? Okay, so Diane, why are you having uh, an Ubuntu demo day here at the uh, Museum of Computing in Swindon? Originally, um, somebody on the Ubuntu UK mailing list asked about doing a Geekathon here, and that was something at the time, it was before Christmas, I didn't have time to organise then, but in the spring... I thought it would be a good idea to give the mailing list members a chance to meet up in person if they wanted to, and also be a ch- good chance to publicise the museum. OK, so why an Ubuntu day rather than uh, a Linux uh, demo day? Was it just because it came from the Ubuntu UK d- uh, mailing list? Yes, that was the main reason. Um, the only Linux I've ever used is Ubuntu, and I've only been using that for 18 months, so I'm really not an expert. I, somebody has emailed me and said, why why Ubuntu? Why? What about all the rest? And I thought, I can hardly expect to talk about something that I've never even used, and I'm not in a position to say to my fellow volunteers, you know about Red Hat, run a demo day. So that's what basically why I've chosen Ubuntu. But there's going to be other people there that can talk about other distributions if necessary. So whilst it is you know aimed at Ubuntu, um, we can of course talk about other demos and uh, distributions uh, during the day. Yes, there'll be other people bringing their own laptops with other de- uh, distros on, and also the Wiltshire lug will be there. So there'll be a chance to look at other distros and talk about them if you want to okay excellent so um who's actually going to be there you got anybody specific coming i mean i know there's people from the ubuntu uk uh, local community but anybody else coming uh, we've got the wiltshire lug as i've said and um, we've also got the wiltshire computer users group are going to be coming okay so what is it you actually hope to achieve by having a, an install day a, a demo day here at um here at the museum It'll be a chance for us all to meet each other in the flesh, as it were, and to look at each other's desktops and admire our graphics. And also it'll be a chance to tell local people about the advantages of Linux and free software in general. And also, from my point of view, of course, I want to promote the museum. I want to let people know about the museum. So, Diane, tell me about the museum. Um, We've been here in the University of Bath in Swindon now for about four or five years. Though at the moment the university are planning to leave Swindon, so we're not sure what will be happening from July, but we're hoping to find somewhere else to go. We've had a great time here. We've had a lot of interesting visitors, including Sir Clive Sinclair, you may have heard of him, and um, His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent came last year. We put on a lot of interesting displays too for um, the Science Museum and for Intel, who are our sponsors. We pr- um, we've also provided a lot of um, resources for pl- people like ITN, BBC, CNN. When they have computer-based news, they like to come here and film a bit to, um, you know, to slip into their newscasts. So you may have seen us on the television and not realised. We've got about um, 3,000 items of hardware and about 2,000 books and about 2,000 items of software. So as you can see, only a tiny bit is on display at any one time. And um, our Pong to PlayStation exhibition, which has been very popular, is going on tour um, from April next year. So that will be going around the country to different museums. So if you can't make it to Swindon, you may be able to see it in a museum near you soon it's called the pong to playstation but in fact we have got a wii there but uh, pong to wii just doesn't sound just doesn't have the same ring somehow okay it's a fantastic um, facility you've got it stacks and stacks of old computers and uh, great for people like me to um, to remember uh, past times so what's the actual plan what are we going to see on the demo day itself i've got some of the um, ubuntu screencasts on dvd we'll be running those through the day so people can look at those if they want to. Um, We'll have some demo machines up and running that people can try out Ubuntu and the other variations on it on a machine so they can sit down and try it out. 
see what it's like, see what it does. There'll be um, chances for them to meet up with people who are using it and ask questions about things like graphics, things like sound, will my digital camera work? Chance for people who've only ever used Windows, really, to look at the alternatives. Are they going to be able to uh, walk away from your demo day with Linux? And are they going to have um, support? I mean, if somebody gets home with a... Uh, and installs Linux, Ubuntu, and they can't quite work it out. Where do they go from there? We're going to have information on the various places that you can get help, and that will include, of course, the Wiltshire Lug and the Wiltshire Computer Users Group, who are both lo- local. Um, they'll also be able to have information on where to get help online, for instance, the forum, the IRC channels, um, places like that, the mailing list, um, so that help. Hopefully, you know they'll be able to feel that they can take this away, try it out, and then if they want to install it, they can go ahead, but still have support there. You've aimed the day at um, at computer users or people interested in uh, looking at Ubuntu. Um, what about their families? If somebody, if Dad comes down in his car, wants to have a look at the museum, check out Ubuntu. What? Um, What's here for for the family? I, I gather you've put a sheet together of things for family to do whilst Dad's um, getting a bit of a, a look at the computers. Yes, we've got um, we have got some items in the com- in the computer museum for children. We've got quizzes and we've got a chance to design your own games character and build it out of Lego. But also, I've created a sheet of things to do locally within a twenty minute drive or which are on the bus route that serves the campus. Um, covering shopping, um, activities for children. In fact, the the local cinema is a 10 to 15 minute walk away and that has children's cinema on Saturdays for a pound a go. And there's a shopping centre for you to look around if you don't want to go to the cinema with them. I haven't included sporting activities, but there are several sports centres within a short distance too. As well. If you don't like shopping or children's activities, we've got um, Coatwater Country Park a short distance away, which has got plenty for children and young people and adults to do um so i've tr- i've tried that's what i was trying to do um i know it is a big problem for families one one parent wants to go to something and the other parent says you're at work all week i never see you uh, there is plenty of other things to do here in swindon so don't feel that you can't come and bring the family because you can okay Diane, thanks very much so it sounds like there's a lot to do where is it when is it again it's on the 26th of april at uh, the university at swindon okay is where can they get more details www.museum-of-computing.org.uk and is diane looking for people to help out yeah i mean we've been on the email list and she's got a lot of people offering up um, their help uh, there's a lot of people taking along uh, laptops and things with different distros and and that sort of thing uh, there's lots of park in there it's a great venue actually it's quite big big school hall uh, there's lots of space excellent so what bits of kit did you see that were uh, particularly interesting loads of really good old geeky stuff um everything zx81s uh, spectrum is it all, all, on, stuff. all on show um no they've they've got a, only a small amount of it actually on show and uh, you can get to see that when you're there <laughs> We've got a guest with us uh, today who's travelled a very long way just to be here. Isn't that right, Dave? Yes, and I've brought the entire lug with me. <laughs> yeah, you're. Um, this is Dave Murphy, who on IRC is known as Schwuck. When you say you brought your whole lug with you, you, ha- you haven't brought anyone with you. I am Cumbria Lug. You are the smallest lug in the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this isn't fair. There are other members of Cumbria Lug. It's just that uh, it's become a joke over time that Cumbria Lug consists of me and is also known as Schwuck Lug. So where does that name Schwuck come from? Yeah, when I first wanted to get onto the internet, I was looking around for nicknames and because everyone else had one, all the cool guys had one, and I just didn't know what to go with. All the interesting ones already taken, so I started trying to think of something different, and I eventually settled on Schwuck, which was uh, stuck in my mind from a few years previously. But it actually comes from a film called "She's Having a Baby" by John Hughes, and at the end sequence of the film is they're discussing names for the babies. And they have lots of celebrities and random people on talking about different names. And the one that stuck in my mind was Bill Murray, who said, Schwuck, I don't know what it means. I heard it on the bus the other day. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Excellent. (laughs) And the other thing I want to say is that it is Schwuck. There is no M in it. What? (laughs) Schmuck. Oh, I see. (laughs) Took me a while there. Sorry about that. In which case, the M is in your nick. (laughs) (laughs) So you've come all the way down from uh, Cumbria Lug. Sunny Cumbria. Sunny Cumbria. 
and um, you were kind enough to do the uh, graphics for the podcast website. Yeah, well, I've been in the Ubuntu UK community for, well, basically since it started. And I did the original logo for the Loco team. And when you said you wanted to do a similar logo or, or theme for the podcast, I said, right, I'll do it. I'll help out. Yeah, you turned it around pretty quick as well. So yeah. I'm interested. What, what, what tools did you actually use to do the artwork? All open source, of course. Uh, all the graphics were done in Inkscape. The original logo for Ubuntu UK was done in Inkscape. And so I just adapted that and carried on working in Inkscape to do that. I now use 100% open source tools for all my work. So uh, I used Inkscape, Inkscape to do that for the... PHP theme, uh, sorry, the WordPress theme, which is uh, essentially PHP. Uh, again, uh, all edited openly. Excellent. So w- one thing we didn't mention, you actually work for Canonical, don't you? <laughs> I've been very careful my pronunciation of that then. <laughs> yes, I, I, I do work for Canonical. Yes, Canonical. I've worked for Canonical for almost a year now. My main job is a developer on the Launchpad team, but I'm also currently working with the hardware certification side, commercial certification. One thing we're definitely not going to ask you is uh, when Launchpad is going to be open source, because I think that's a tired old question that you probably get asked an awful lot yes and i can't answer it it'll be open sourced when it's ready good yeah. right move on <laughs> you uh, as well as working for canonical and doing marvelous graphics for free for people like us you um you spend a bit of time writing don't you yeah i've uh, actually written two books now uh, i've written one myself and i helped co-author the second edition of the official ubuntu book and what, what does the book contain because i've not actually seen it you haven't? Why haven't you bought a copy? He <laughs> well, I was, I was expecting you to send me a review copy. <laughs> the book covers everything about installing and running Ubuntu. It comes with a copy on the DVD. Uh, it is actually the DVD version. It's not just the CD version forced onto the... What does the, what does the DVD have over the CD version? It has additional software packages, so you don't have to go onto the internet to install. Oh, okay. A lot of packages. You said there's two books. What's the other one? The other book is my own one, which took me about a year and a bit to write, which is Managing Software Development with Track and Subversion, which... Sounds geeky. It's very geeky, and also came out after I started working on Launchpad and Bazaar, so (laughs) not not the best timing in the world. But I I started it when I was in my previous job, when I was working exclusively with uh, Track and Subversion, and I built a development system around this. Track, is is that the the thing that's got a wiki and a request tracker built in, and... Again, uh, it's open source, it's written in Python, it's developed by the Edgewall guys. It's an excellent, excellent product. It's a wiki, it's a source code browser, it's a ticketing system, and it's a project planning application, and, and it allows you to do manage your software from end to end. And does it link with Subversion? That's why Yes, it, 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 it's integrated both. very tightly with Subversion, but you can use other version control systems with it. Subversion is the most common one you use with it. Okay. Well, thanks for talking to us about those uh, projects, and uh, are you going to stick around for the rest of the show? Yes, happily, if you'll have me. Cool, yeah. <laughs> you'll go make the tea, though. Okay. <laughs> Right, so we've we've all installed Ubuntu on laptops and desktops and servers and stuff, but I wanted to ask about what other, maybe weird, maybe small, maybe different hardware you've installed Ubuntu on. Simon? I've got uh, my EPC set here um, with Ubuntu on it, and not specifically Ubuntu, but Debian on my uh, NSLU2, a little Linksys slug thing. And how did you install Ubuntu on that EPC? Uh, USB stick. And it works fine? Yeah, great. No problems at all. Fast enough? Oh, yeah. I know some people complain that Ubuntu is a little bit slower than the Xandros that you get on that EPC. I didn't even bother with Xandros, literally turned it on, put Ubuntu on it straight away. Sorry, are there complaints actually using it or the boot up time and shutdown time? Um, boot up and shutdown initially. I know, you, I know you can trim down the programs that, that start up. Well, the thing is, GNOME isn't a lightweight desktop, is it? It's going to be slow on any slow PC. Yeah. I tried putting it on slower machines myself and given up and gone to uh, XFCE. Is that what you're using, XFCE? On yeah, the... it is, yeah. But um, Hardy's going to go on. Once Hardy's released, then uh, I'm going to put Hardy on it. And you're going to put Hardy XFCE or Hardy? No, no. Gnome will be Gnome. straight on it. Yep. See, I run Gnome on mine, and I, th- I think it's a little bit bulky. But I've got more memory in mine. But... Yeah, I'm running uh, Zubuntu on my XFCE. Um, but the only thing i found that's really bugged me is the resolution. Because it's an 800 by 600 resolution, The uh, a lot of the applications don't quite fit into that space. It's 800 by 480. <laughs> okay, 800 by 480, <laughs> I'm corrected there. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, if there's anyone else found that applications just don't fit very well, Thunderbird being a bit a big one with that. Yeah, evolution doesn't fit either. That's one of the things. It's always it's it, the logical progression over time has always been bigger, bigger, bigger screens, and now we've suddenly taken a step backwards to a screen that's actually smaller than anything because. 800 by 480, I don't recall many many desktops or laptops that have ever had that resolution. 
it's a widescreen resolution that you don't get on laptops. Yeah, it's small, but it's just whatever you're used to. And you can work around it. You know, you can drag the windows around and stuff like that. But yeah. so you would say it's a successful install. Then. Absolutely, it goes everywhere with me. Yeah, you use it all the time. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And what was the other thing you got? A uh, slug. The slug, the NSLU two Linksys. Um, it's a file server. You much better just plug it into your network. Um, plug a hard drive into it and and share files across your network because it's flashable. It's great. You put Debian on it and. Um, I basically use it as a gateway into my home network. So, so in essence, it's actually a mini computer in basically what is a hard drive enclosure, is it? It's about the same size as a as a full size hard drive, but um, yeah, it's a mini computer. Yeah, they're pretty tiny, aren't they? Yeah, and no fans, completely silent, sits in the corner on top of the router, and um, you don't even know it's there. And how hard would you say it was to actually install Debian on there? Because it doesn't come with Debian as default, does it? It was um, not a doddle, but it wasn't incredibly hard. And of course, you know, that's what we have a community for. Ask people and they uh, let you know how, how to do it and what's going wrong. So what about you, Dave? What have you got? I've got in front of me here the OpenMoco uh, Neo 1973 phone. Uh, it's, a, it's a mobile telephone, which is Linux-based. And uh, I should say thank you to Andy Lufferin for sending it down to me. It's a short notice. It's actually running a version called Utopia. Now, when, when you first switch it on, you get greeted by a flashy boot screen, and then it, it falls back to the kernel black screen, uh, it, giving out kernel messages. Is it not just under development, so it's not... Like oh, the yeah, it version. is, but I actually think that's nice. I actually like the fact that it's actually a computer that fits in the palm of your hand. I think that's brilliant. And the fact that you can actually SSH to it, I mean, you could you can run any software on here, really, that you can run on a low-powered computer. Is I mean, that, there's is that, people running web servers on these things. Is that not a real you know geek thing? Your average user is not going to want to SSH oh, to their definitely. phone. Definitely, but I mean, everything has a geek theme. I mean, think of the iPhone. People are jailbreaking them, and they're they're doing custom things on them themselves because it appeals to to people who want pretty things and the geeks. I mean, a lot of manufacturers are realizing that there is a big geek thing. Linksys latched onto this quite early on with their Linux firmware, and they found that geeks wanted to buy them as well as well as just regular users. So I think having it appeal to, to both sides of the market, I think is brilliant. Yeah, I don't suppose the geek market is that big. I don't know. I think you'd be surprised, really. You know, I, I think uh, there's a lot of geeks that the first Linux phone that actually becomes stable, I think a lot of people are going to buy that. I know I will. Yeah, but you're a geek, and everyone else in this room is a geek. So, <laughs> and probably... 90% of the people who listen to this will be geeks. And exactly so. I think I think all of you people should be buying one. <laughs> <laughs> Support freedom. <laughs> okay, I'll buy one. <laughs> Actually, I'll just take yours before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Andy would be a bit displeased at that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's got some bugs. Um, I mean, trying to make certain phone calls, it, it seemed to fail. But I mean, it, it isn't ready for public release yet. But I think when it is, I think it'd be a really good phone. The only thing, as I understand it, it doesn't actually have 3G on which is a real shame. And I think if they had included that, I mean, I don't know the technical side behind that, but if they had included that and got this out before the iPhone, I think it would have been it would have been a good contender to the iPhone. I really do. No. No? No, it wouldn't have been. Not at all. Everyone I know who has seen an iPhone wants one. And I trying to compare that to the iPhone just wouldn't have happened because the iPhone is, hasn't got 3G either. It's for user experience that is selling it for people. So what other small... Uh, actually, you've got a tiny device from the next, haven't you, Dave? <laughs> Tiny device? <laughs> I used to have an N810, yes. I also used to have a Zorus as well. So I've, I've been a big fan of Linux-based PDAs and devices for a while, but I've not found one that I'm very happy with yet. Isn't that the problem there? It's a great idea in, in concept to carry around a Linux machine in your pocket, but nobody's quite, or have they, quite got it right. Oh, no, I think the Nokia N810 is actually pretty near perfect. So I'm getting confused here. It's the N800 I have, it's the N810 I want. And the N810 isn't a phone, though, is it? No, none of them are a phone, but they will act as an internet phone. They do come with Skype and Project Gizmo. See, that to me is crazy. Nokia, which is probably the biggest telephone manufacturer in the world, have made a device which isn't a phone. No, but it's very specifically not a phone. It is an internet tablet. It is a web-enabled device purely for accessing the internet, for email, for videos, for audio. Uh, it's a great media device, but it's not a phone, even though I used it extensively as a Skype device when I used it. it was, it's got SIP built into it. It's got the Java protocol, XMPP. Uh, uh, earlier on, you said you actually got rid of it. Uh, why, why was that? Uh, I love the device. My wife loved using the device as well. She used it more than I did. Uh, the problem was simply that I've got a laptop, so I don't need a little portable device. And because I work from home, I don't travel a lot. So I didn't really need it. What future projects have particularly interested you? 
Well, the Open Moco is very interesting to me, and I will probably be picking up one of the consumer devices when they come out. The Nokia N810 is also very interesting, and the future versions of that device, when they come along, will also interest me. We've got Ubuntu Mobile Edition coming out in the future, which should bring some interesting devices with it. But apart from that, I'm not sure what else is out there. Uh, Trolltech's cute phone, or green phone, whatever it's called, has taken a long time to come, and it, it's now changed completely from when I last saw the developer release, so... Yeah, I've got a couple of machines in the garage um, running that are um, running Linux. One's uh, running IPCOP, and the other one is just a, an install of the Ubuntu server. Um, they're both fairly low-power machines. They're both Pentium 2 400 megahertz with 192 mega RAM. They're tiny, and they run perfectly fine, and they're not under heavy load. The IPCOP is my gateway firewall to the outside world and does all my DHCP and all the kind of like networky stuff that it needs to. And I've had those running for a couple of years, and they're perfectly fine. I, you know, if I tried to run Windows on them or anything else, I think I'd have a bit of a problem. So, what spec machine have you got IPCOP on? Uh, it's the same. It's a Pentium 2 400. You run IPCOP as well, don't you, Dave? I do, yes. It's running on a very, very old machine, a Pentium 133 MMX with about 128 mega RAM and I think it's about a 2 gig hard disk as well. So. <laughs> Your your low nice. spec machine trumps my low spec <laughs> machine if we're I, aiming for the lowest we can get. I think it might actually be the first computer that I owned and it's still running after all this time. It's been running IP Cop happily for at least three years now. Uh, IP Cop made me a fan of the specialised distributions. Before that, I didn't see the point because I thought Linux, you can do anything. Why bother having one of these specialised ones that runs off a floppy disk or whatever? But IP Cop does the job it's designed to so well. It really does show the power of Linux, which you don't get when you're just comparing things like Fedora and Ubuntu. That br- that brings us back round to uh, all the other machines, like the Asus EPC has got a customised version of Linux. It's Xandros, but it's you know it's customised for that machine. The Nokia N810 has a customised version of Linux. The Open Moco has a customized version of Linux. So yeah, the things like IPCOP, which are you know specific for one purpose, are showing off the best of Linux in some ways. But in other ways, it's a problem because nobody ever sees it as being Linux. You know, it's 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 just a piece of software that works. Well, I think that's especially true with the uh, routers you can buy off the shelf. I mean, a good proportion of them are running Linux. But you wouldn't know that just by using that, which doesn't help really spread the word. So, yeah, I, I certainly agree with you there, Alan. And you sound like a real nerd when you say to your friends, you know, have you ever used Linux? And they say no. And you go, well, actually, you have. Your router's running Linux. And you <laughs> sound like a real idiot. Well, I do. So we had a comment on uh, the last podcast, and um, it kind of stood out for me, which was um, somewhat of a complaint about the way I pronounce the name of the distribution that I happen to use, which is Ubuntu. And I know some people pronounce it differently. Some people say Ubuntu and yeah. Ubuntu. Yeah, I've heard Ubuntu as well. I'm an Ubuntu man. And what do you feel about that? Being criticised for pronouncing things in inverted commas wrong. Everybody's got their own opinion, haven't they? Don't sit on the fence, Simon. See what you really feel. No, no, it's, it's you hate Ubuntu. them, don't you? You I, hate I do. these people. It's, it's Ubuntu. It's not Ubuntu. I know people over the pond call it something different, but Ubuntu. that's just the word. Yeah. Yeah, is that? it's like I had a guy, a couple of American guys, pronounce the three-letter uh, extension on our website, dot .org. We pronounce it dot .org, usually. I mean, I say dot .org, but I've heard Americans call it dot .org, and they always say dot .org. They never say org. So what about open office? Do they call it open office dot org? Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. Some people call it open office. Some people call it open office dot org. And some people get really ratty if you only call it open office because the official name is open office dot org. Wasn't that a bit like GNU Linux? Oh, the don't official get me name. Started on that one. <laughs> yeah, there's the GNU slash Linux, but there's also Linux itself. Like some people call it Linux. Some people call it Linux or no, Linux. No, no. Yeah. Well, you listen to Linux. the man. I mean, obviously the, the files out on the internet yeah. listen to Linus saying Linux. Now, you see, you've criticised yourself there. You've, you've contradicted yourself because you said that it doesn't matter. And yet now you're saying you should enforce it with the sound file of a man who created the product. Well, no, but if you want to get an idea, and the guy's obviously been asked so many times, he's just said, well, I'd say it like this. Okay. So do you carry around that web file? Yeah, yeah. I saw my phone. So what you want is Mark to go and record a similar file for you. Good idea. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would, actually. You said GNU. What about GNOME? Is it GNOME or is it GNOME? Well, it's GNOME. Or it's GNOME, but everyone calls it GNOME. I call it GNOME. I think I call it GNOME. So now you put me on the spot. I don't know. Yeah, earlier on, I, when we weren't recording, I said, I pronounce Ubuntu, Ubuntu. And everyone said that I said it t- different ways, two different ways. And so I can't think now. Do I say GNOME or GNOME? 
I'll say GNOME. GNOME. But it, it doesn't matter how you say it. If someone knows what you're talking about, that's fine. Yeah, get the message across. Well, it's like ASUS. Is that yeah, yeah. Is that right? Oh, yeah, is that, that's is my... That Asus? Yeah, Alan, okay. who, who makes the E? Oh, right. <laughs> Which well, manufacturer? you said yourself. It doesn't matter if I get the message across. Although, actually, I clearly didn't because you all looked at me puzzled when I said Asus EPC. <laughs> I figured somebody was copying them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, oh, yeah, I use uh, XFC on the EPC. So is that Xubuntu or Zubuntu? Oh, it's Zubuntu. Yeah, I'd say Zubuntu. But is that laziness? It's like, I think, I think it's partly laziness that I say Zubuntu because it's easier rather than, yeah, because I'm saving myself one syllable. If I say X Ubuntu, it's longer than saying Zubuntu. Same with GNOME. If I say GNOME, it's one less syllable than GNOME. But do you know where I think all this discussion comes from? Is the fact that I first heard of Ubuntu by text, you know, IRC, main list, things like that. Now, the trouble is with this is sometimes you can use words for maybe a year or so um, in text and then when you actually talk to people you think oh how, actually, how do you say that I don't think we would have this problem if maybe we heard of Ubuntu from TV adverts things like that where we actually hear it we, then we would then reproduce but, that but that doesn't always work either because if you watch a TV advert for a Nokia phone some people call it Nokia and some people call it Nokia and some people oh. call Nike Nike and some people call it Nike I got and, told that about one yesterday with Nike and Nike yeah see so it happens it's not just geeks it's not just the geek pronunciation evil people who jump on you for pronouncing something right it happens in real life as well. I was guilty of one of these in la- the last podcast because someone said less watts and I jumped in and said fewer watts. Because, Which really threw me off spot. Yeah, it did. Uh, and that worked well. <laughs> because, because grammatically less watts is, you know, incorrect and fewer watts is, is right. But that was just me being, you know, anally retentive. And, yeah, you're yeah, bordering between geek and nerd there. Yeah, it uh, is. I must say, I haven't actually got round to contacting the person who posted that and actually telling them they need to correct their grammar. Well, it's I okay because someone, yet. when when IBM, oh no, sorry, Intel set up the lesswatts.org website, someone else was equally as miffed and set up fewerwatts.org and pointed it to less watts. See, someone actually <laughs> paid money to do that. That to me is crazy. So I think we've not pronunciation, or how do you say it, Dave? <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> pronunciation. Pronunciation. Pronunciation on the head there. Yeah. As a professional open source worker, I use Linux on a daily basis. I don't use it for anything else now. I, I, oh, sorry, I don't use any other operating system now. And I, when I do go back to Windows, for whatever reason, I find it very difficult to actually get anything done because I've been using Linux professionally for a couple of years and I've been using it personally for a huge number of years since uh, the early 2000s. So I was interested in how other people got on going back to Windows and whether they would actually go back or not. I use it at work. I have to use it at work, although I, I try not to. I've got a, yeah, an Ubuntu box sat in the corner. I try and use that as much as I can. I use the work box for email and everything else I do on the Ubuntu box. I don't have any, I was going to say I don't have any at home, but I do. Um, but that's purely my son's PC um, for games. Um, but the whole family's converted um, to Ubuntu completely. They love it. Well, I think for myself, um, I don't think I actually could go back. I, I feel very trapped, actually, um, which is funny being trapped by freedom now now i'm quite into it uh, i don't think i could actually go back to a, a closed source software but in some ways i'm actually jealous of people that do use that and are happy with it because i don't think i could actually go back to it well so you you think that people who are using windows and mac and whatever are in some way happier because they're kind of ignorant yes. of, of all of this stuff, yes. so they don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there, there is software on Linux that isn't available, and I have to put up with that. But if I was using um, more of a mainstream do, um, platform, then I wouldn't have that same problem. But I can't go back to that, because I'm so into Linux now. Yeah, that's what you mean. And, and there's also people who, I don't know, it depends how, much, how long you've been into it, because for us, we've all been into it for a while, you know, one, two, three, five, ten years, or however long. But there are people who've only been using it for like six months and they try it out and they think it's not for them and then they quit for want of a better word so it's probably easier for somebody who's not been in it my um my kids use it a lot uh, and my wife as well and um initially they were they were frustrated by the lack of things that they had in windows but it was only when they sort of understood and were educated and and i said to them yeah what is it you actually want what is it you're missing and they realized that actually it was nothing at all my wife's actually had to go back to Windows recently. I've had to install Windows at home because um, she wants to do the ECDL. Oh, now is she, that ECDL, the European Computer Driving that's License? That's the one. And, um, so qualification of some kind. Yeah, it was for work. You know, in theory, she'd be more employable if she had the ECDL. And she initially started using Windows. We've been using Linux for years now. 
and then I put windows back on and she can't stand it. <laughs> Absolutely hates it. Brilliant. And having read um, the ECDL book, she can't believe that people put up with viruses and spyware and all that sort of stuff when, you know, Linux is free and it does it and all these things just disappear. There's got to be there's got to be something that would make you go back. What would it be if Ubuntu crashed and burned? You know, Mark Shuttleworth got bored and disappeared, and the Ubuntu Foundation ran out of money, and Ubuntu stopped, you know, development. And then I don't know, Debian crashed and burned, and you know, so your your two major options. Okay, there are other distributions available, <laughs> but the two that you're you're not you're most into. You know, what would you do? Would you just switch to another distro and and carry on as normal and focus your attention on that? Yeah, I think so, definitely. Well, I mm. I don't know. I honestly don't know what I would do. I mean, when I do have to use a Windows computer, I actually feel frustration. And yeah. I, don't, I don't think I could. Um, I might explore Mac. I, I'm quite a Mac newbie. I might I might have to pursue that. But A friend of mine was uh, was told at work, you can have uh, a new PC, but it has to be a Mac. And he's a, a Linux, you know, fan and very, very technically competent with, with Linux. And his boss said, I want you to spend time working. So I want you to use a Mac and I don't want you to spend time fiddling about because if you're using Linux, you probably will spend a certain portion of your time fiddling about with the machine. But he's a he's a pragmatic kind of guy. As I remember, he runs a Windows machine purely for gaming. He boots it up to play games and then shuts it down again and never boots it for anything else. So you know, if you if you're open minded enough to to say I like free software and I like the freedom that free software gives me, but equally I also want to play games. So I'm going to have this machine dedicated to running Windows and. You know, I'll sacrifice my freedom on that machine. And then I've got this other machine at work where they provide it and I'm sacrificing my freedom on that because it's running closed source software. I don't know. Should we be a bit more open and... O- open to being closed? It, well, yeah, I know. It sounds a bit bizarre. But should we be more open to, to accepting the closed sourced software? Is there is there any philosophical reason that you would go back? Would you give up on free software? Is there any compelling reason why you would say, okay, enough's enough. I'm just going to switch back to Windows or OS 10 or whatever the other platform is. Well, actually, again, prior to my current job, I was always very tempted. I still very am. I'm very tempted by OS 10. But the thing that stops me every single time is that it's not free. I'd be, I'd, I'm happy to pay for the hardware and I'm, I would love the features of the software. Don't get me started on iTunes. It's the, iTunes is the one reason I still have a Windows box in my house is to manage the various iPods we have. But the actual choice of choosing a non-free operating system over a free one, I would have trouble with philosophically. You've just touched on the other reason why I, I booted Windows the other day, which was to run iTunes in order to see if this podcast appeared on <laughs> iTunes and verify that it did. And in fact, when I put a blog post up saying... This podcast is now available on iTunes. One of the first comments was, uh, okay, who's the freedom hater that put it on <laughs> iTunes? And that was no, you, no. wasn't uh, it? <laughs> <laughs> it was, yes. I did post on iTunes. I, iTunes is the one app that I really miss from Windows, and I would love to see a native port of. Uh, running through Wine would maybe just about cut it, but I would love to see it natively running on Linux. It interests me because I've been using Linux for years now. Unfortunately, my job involved, my, my previous job involved Windows. I was a .NET developer, so I used Visual Studio on a daily basis. I had to use uh, Microsoft Office on a daily basis. I kept trying to switch to Linux at work and messing around with Windows and VMware and all the rest of it, but it never worked. But whenever I did switch back from using Linux to Windows, I would automatically automatically go to all the open source applications and end up figuring, why the hell am I running Windows yeah. to run all this stuff when I could just do it on Linux? Because the, the bits that I did have to do were very little, so I just had one machine that was purely for development and my desktop actually ran Linux completely. I kept I flip-flopped for so long between the two until I finally settled in Linux and only used Windows when I absolutely had to for my job. I had Which to, I don't have to anymore. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Result. I had, a, I had an issue at work uh, related to this where um, I uh, installed a Ubuntu on a company laptop and we had a, a security guy come around and have a look at it and tell me that it wasn't company policy. And, and actually that went escalated up to my boss. He came over and said, well, so long as you can support your own machine and you can get the job done, I don't really care what you run on your your laptop, so long as it's secure and you've got all the updates and all that. So, you know, I've, I've used Ubuntu in company situations instead of Windows and it works well for me and I, I find it very difficult going back to Windows, much like the rest of you. Any of us probably wouldn't switch back permanently. No, it's difficult to see a situation where all free software ever would just disappear and you wouldn't have any access to it anyway. I think it's actually uncontrollable. I mean, once the genie's out of the bottle, I don't think it can be closed back in. Free software will keep going. 
in the last episode, we asked for some feedback to our email address um, or comments on the website, and uh, we got some. We got a fair amount, in fact. Yeah. And a couple of them, uh, I thought I'd mention, uh, we were asked by uh, Matthew Daubney uh, if we could, I've probably mispronounced his name and I'm going to get more emails from him now, but Matthew <laughs> asked us if we could do hardware reviews, which um, we kind of talked about already in this podcast. Yeah, if people send us their hardware, we'll review it. Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, free stuff. Yes. yes. For, for keeps? Well, uh, obviously. Well, for review purposes, and to do a comprehensive review, you've got to keep it for the lifetime of the product, really. Yeah, two to three years minimum. Yeah, easily. So I should say thank you, for Andy, for letting me keep your OpenMoco phone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thanks to anyone who wants to send me free hardware. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah. Um, we also had a, a mail from Sean Anderson about pronunciation, which we've covered earlier on, or pronunciation, as Dave says. <laughs> 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 You're never going to live that down. Um, yeah. And we had a lot of people comment about the audio in the last podcast. Tony, yeah. Yeah. we had a few, didn't we? Quite a few. Quite a few. But a, to a be substantial fair, substantial proportion of the people who uh, did comment were commenting about the audio levels. But that's pretty much the only negative feedback we've had, isn't it? Yeah, I, I prefer to think it was an area for improvement okay. rather than negative. So, sorry, is that your only area, is that? And that's the only area that needs improving on the show, is it? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> You're a swine, Dave Walker. Um, yeah, and there, there were lots of people who wrote in. Roger Light, Raphael Carreras, Andrew Ball, and about half a dozen other people who gave us feedback on IRC. It wasn't all that bad. Come on, guys, cut us some slack. It was our first episode. Um, yeah, they were a little bit a little bit wonky, but you know, it was the first time we did it. Uh, we're going to get things slightly better this time, and uh, I'm sure it will improve every show as we go on. But it, it is uh, appreciated, even feedback like yeah, things, things negative. Like that. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's it's constructive like, criticism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be fair, we we've got a lot right. I think in the first episode, you know, we got uh, content length. You know, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, lots of people said they like the length of the show, which is really good. We're going to try and keep it about that, sort of half an hour to 40 minutes tops. Um, something will fit into a lunch a lunch hour or a, a short train journey, hopefully. Uh, we also should, at this point, remind you how to get feedback uh, to the show. Uh, you can leave a comment on the website. You can get in contact with us by email, which is podcast at ubuntu-uk.org, or by phone, which is uh, our current manned voicemail number, which is 0845. 508-1986 or by IRC which is hash ubuntu-uk which is on the Freenode network or the other way is via Twitter Dave, tell us about Twitter Twitter is what is popularly called microblogging which is an absolute rubbish term just like everything else you hear like Web 2.0 but it's very small messages, 140 characters, so the same as a SMS message. But you send it to the Twitter site and it just gets published in the timeline like everyone else. And you can follow other people and you can publish your own things. And we've set up an Ubuntu UK one, which is twitter.com slash UUPC. And you so people can follow that UUPC person. They and... can follow that UUPC person. They can see what we're doing when we're recording because we'll Twitter when we're start a recording which is when we're not recording and we'll twitter when new posts come out or something interesting is happening and if anybody is want is anybody else is using twitter they can follow us and we can see how popular we are so presumably they could actually send us suggestions via twitter they as well. can send us suggestions by twitter they can either send them directly to us you can with twitter you can send messages to people by putting at in front of their name uh, so, so if they do show up, at uupc and then yes. say something it'll come straight to it, us it'll actually show up in our replies list or they can send us a direct message by putting D space UUPC and then the message. That'll come through to us as well, but that'll be private. But it won't be shown on the Twitter site. But they have to sign up to Twitter to do that? They will have to be signed up to do this. Okay. So if you don't want to sign up to Twitter, you can just go to the site and view the updates directly on the website, twitter.com slash UUPC. Yeah. Or you can contact us, as Dave said, in the traditional way, via phone or email or IRC. <laughs> Okay, I think that just about wraps it up for another show. Um, it's worth just saying that we do make the entire show on, on Ubuntu. It's processed in Ubuntu. The website's all done on Ubuntu and hosted on Ubuntu. The first episode we um, we hosted on uh, just one server. Yeah. But, but now we've got um, a few mirrors provided by uh, Dave, well, myself, and also uh, Andy from Bitfolk. Yes, who, thank you very much, Bitfolk. Yes, they're providing two mirrors, one over here and one in the States. So. Yeah. Uh, and we hit about two and a half thousand downloads on the first episode. So. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. It was quite high, and it's it's tailed off a little bit, of course, since the first episode was released nearly two weeks ago. But uh, Mira's much appreciated. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
Right, that's it. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks Bye, very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.